Have you enjoyed any of this series so far? I know that I have. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 7. I want to save myself plenty of time and not do a whole lot of the small talk. Welcome to all of you here who are first-time visitors today. And uh, like I said, if you want church to be boring, you're really at the wrong one, I'm telling you. We're turning it up every way that we can here. We're excited about our God and what He's doing in our life. Amen. <clears throat> anyway, I have uh, been in this series, Hidden in Plain Sight, and um, knowing that there are so many people that get saved here literally every week, and there are people coming in you every week, and people who have not been around church, been around the faith very often, it, it messes with me in the back of my mind because... You know, I want everybody to hear everything, but I can't. I don't have time. So I preach in series, and usually the next builds on the last. <clears throat> so to make it all make sense and hear me in context, all that stuff is online. And those of you visiting, I would love for you to go back and hear the first what, three or four messages that we've already done. And uh, what I am attempting to do, what, what are you doing, Ron? What I'm attempting to do is get spiritual things out in the open and talk about them. I don't know all the dynamics behind it, but for whatever reason, we have a church that has gone silent in this generation on spiritual things. All while the world is lifting up its voice even louder. Hollywood has no problem throwing out 15 movies full of demons. No problem whatsoever. And the church just goes quiet. We think that stuff is messy. We don't want to fool with it don't really understand it and in Bible school they don't teach you how to handle it and so what happens is you have people wrestling things they can't see people fighting stuff and they don't know what they're fighting people having desires on the inside of them and don't know how to make them stop don't know how to make them go away this is not a behavior Christianity is not a behavior modification course you are not free because you changed your behavior you are free when your desires change. That's when you are free. You're not free when you want to and you're trying to make yourself not. You're free when you and God want the same thing. That's when real freedom comes. And people are doing things, they say, I don't even like what I'm doing. I don't even like the fact that I attract that kind of guy. I don't even like the kind of woman that I date. I don't even, uh, why, why do I go to those activities? Why is that always my fallback? Why, why is it that I'm doing this in the middle of the night, don't like it, but don't have the power to stop it? All these things are because there is a spiritual conflict that is taking place every day in your life. And if somebody don't talk about it, we're going to be ignorant of it. And uh, just because you don't know a thing don't mean your enemy thinks it's unfair. He's going to paint a bullseye on whatever you don't know because the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Perish for lack of knowledge. So, you know, what you don't know does hurt you. And so I'm going through all this stuff in the Bible about the spiritual dynamics. And I tell you, I haven't seen any pushback on it. I've seen people really embracing it uh, because I think the light is coming on. Come on, somebody. Like I said, when I show you your enemy, he's, he's not nearly as lethal when you can see him. So Father, I just ask that you bless what we're about to do. I ask that you give me supernatural ability to communicate. I pray that whether people are seasoned Christians or first time they've ever been in a church, let me communicate, let me communicate clearly to them. And I pray, Lord, that everybody would be able to go home knowing what it is you would have them to do. Bless this time. Bless your word. Bless these amazing, amazing people. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Tell your neighbor, here we go, here we go, here we go. <laughs> Two things we've talked about thus far. This is my three-minute review, okay? Two things the Bible's talked about. It's talked about generational curses. This is the nature part. There are things you're fighting in nature. There are things you're fighting in nurture. The thing in nature is generational curses. The Bible says that generational curses in Exodus 20 can flow through three to four generations. What are these? These are family sins. 
These are things that have stayed in the bloodline for years. It is no accident that the first thing a doctor will start asking you when you show up in the office is, did your mom have heart disease? Did your dad have heart disease? Does this run in your family? Has anybody been a diabetic before? Has anybody had cancer before? Because even the medical community knows if they can trace it in your family, they can better treat you. The Bible does not call that something medical. The Bible calls that a generational curse. Somehow, something has got permission to get in the family bloodline and flow in that family. There's alcoholism in the bloodline. There are, there are people that cannot, no matter what they do, sustain relationships in the bloodline. Everybody gets hurt. Everybody gets betrayed. People's always abandoning each other. And then you ask them why, and they don't really know can't really give you answers. And they just know that there's this whirling on the inside of them that leads them toward decisions they don't like but don't, cannot identify its source and they do not know how to correct it. And because the church does not, it does not recognize anymore the demonic realm and all the powers of darkness that are at work, we, we try to go and counsel a demon. Demons, you can't counsel them. Okay, you, we, get, we try to medicate them, but you can't medicate a demon. Things like this have to be broken. Somebody say broken. They have to be taken in a spiritual moment by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they have to be broken in your life. You know what, the, you know what God spoke to my heart this morning? Literally, when I was taking a shower before I came in here, he said, I need everybody under the sound of your voice to take this posture, that this ends with me. Come on, somebody. This ends with me. That this will not pass to your daughter. This will not pass to your son. It will not be perpetuated down your bloodline. But you are going to be the person that's going to stand in between what was and what is to come. And it's going to break and it's going to change with you. I wish you'd look at three people right now and say, this ends with me. Come on. This ends with me. This ends with, look at somebody. This ends with me. Hallelujah. Can somebody say amen to that? So we know that general curse, generational curses, they can flow through a bloodline and you can usually trace them somewhere in your mom and dad's life. I talked the very first week, I showed you how the very thing Abraham did, a few years later, Isaac did. Same way, same situation in front of the same people dealing with his daddy's devil. And I kind of told you before you die, everybody's going to deal with their daddy's devil and you got to confront it because what you don't confront grows. Okay, now, second thing we talked about on the third week was yokes. Yokes is nurture. It's not nature, it's nurture. Those are the things that happen. The nature of the yoke in the Bible was they would take an ox and the ox was, a agricultural, was used for agricultural purposes to till up the hard ground. It was too mighty to control once it was full grown, so they would yoke it when it was young. And because it would grow up and the only thing that it knew was the yoke around its neck, its life would take on the pattern of the yoke. So that's why the enemy wants stuff to happen to you when you're eight. Happen to you when you're 11. Wants a small kid to be exposed to pornography at an age where he's not able to process anything. He just saw and all of a sudden he's 40 years old, staying up all night hoping his wife don't see him. Why? because something got sown in him at an early age that has now produced a cycle. Seeds produce cycles. You plant an orange seed, you can have oranges forever. And they come around seasonally. You ever seen people that stay clean for six months? Yes, come on. Yeah. And then go whoop. That, why? Because it's seasonal. Seeds, put, are y'all here? Yes, yes. yes. Y'all scare me. Y'all so quiet. <laughs> Last week, y'all was running around the building. <clears throat> okay. All right. Seeds produce cycles. I was watching. I, I don't have the full context of it, so if I get something wrong, please don't hold it against me. I just remember walking through a room one day. I don't know if I was in an office somewhere, doctors, I don't know. But I saw Oprah interviewing Tyler Perry. And he was talking about some of the events that happened in his youth. And this is what he said. This was so good. I'll never forget it. He said, that put something in me that wasn't supposed to be there. 
That is a great way. And I don't even know if he was speaking out of a biblical context. But he said, there are things that happened to me that I carried into my adult life. Because in that event, in that trauma, in that abandonment, in that perversion, in that twist, in whatever it was that happened, it put something in me that was not supposed to be there. So we've talked about generational curses and how they can be broken, and we've had marvelous times of ministry, and we talked about the yokes and how they can be broken. Now I'm going toward to the hard stuff. You said the hard stuff. Strongholds. We're probably going to be here till Christmas. We will not get out of this. And today's laying foundational. We'll really get into it from here on out. But today I got to lay a groundwork. Don't get bored because I got to talk to you a minute. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll start sweating and running in just a minute. Might toss my boot at you if I get happy. I don't know. <clears throat> strongholds are in the mind. We got to pull down these strongholds. Strongholds are not out there in the air somewhere. They're not something out there in the air with, you know, pointed ears and a forked tail and goo running out its mouth, like you see in the movie. Strongholds are between your ears. And they are fierce. And they are lethal. Because your enemy does not have the power to make you do anything. Old guy named Flip Wilson, way back in my youth, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil ain't made you do nothing. Okay? The only thing the devil has the power to do is to get you to believe a lie. Yeah. And as a man thinketh, he don't have to make it is. He just has to make you think. And as a man thinketh in his heart, that means which he, what he's embraced to be true defines his reality. How did you get here? You thought your way all the way here. Well, no, pastor, I'm a victim. Yeah, and because you were victimized, you think like that. And you thought your way all the way here. It's real quiet in this building. We're going to go there. Come on, somebody. Come on, I preach the truth and let the chips fall where they may, but I'm going to tell you the truth. As a man thinketh in his heart, his thoughts define his reality. That's the only verb in the Bible that God says defines my reality is my thought life. So the enemy, if he can get your thinking off kilter, he can get your life off kilter. If he can have you thinking wrong about marriage, he can destroy your marriage. If he can have you thinking wrong about money, he can keep you enslaved to it your whole life. If he can get you thinking wrong about yourself, he can keep you living as an imposter your whole life and you never know your potential. All the enemy's got the power to do is make you think. Can I tell you what the enemy really is, what Satan really is? He's a mouse with a microphone. <laughs> his real power to influence your life is extremely limited, but his power to affect your life through your mind because he speaks relentlessly. He's always sending thoughts through your head and you can't control all of those. The psychological world calls them intrusive thoughts whatever you want to call them. You can't control all of those. There are things flying in and out your head all day long. The person that cut you off on the way to church, you had about five thoughts <laughs> and what none of them holy. <laughs> okay? Those things come and go. It's not those. It's not the thoughts that come and go. It's the thoughts that come to stay. It's the thoughts that become a part of your belief system. Those are the things that define who you really are. What you think about politics defines your politics. Come on. What you think about family defines your family. What you think about relationships, that, that defines your relationships. What people think about money defines their economy. It all depends on your mind. And can I give you good news? If you can whip it in your mind, you can whip it in your life. Come on, somebody. If you can whip depression right here, you can whip it in your house. If you can whip, ah, if you can whip poverty here, you can whip it in your bank account. If you can whip weakness here and sadness here and bitterness here, you can whip it in your life. All you got to do is win the battle in your head. Somebody shout amen. Are we doing all right? Romans 7. I love Romans 7 
because it lets me know I'm not crazy. Okay? Some of you who have no idea what Romans 7 is, you're going to be so glad I introduced this verse to you here in just a moment because it's going to make you feel much better about yourself. The book of Romans is the greatest dissertation ever written on grace. You need to go read it. Chapter 5 and 6 talks about we are saved by grace. Then he gets to chapter seven and this thing gets weird. For we know, go on to the next verse, verse 15. Let's start at 15. For what I am doing, <laughs> I do not understand. I gotta have a show of hands. If you ever just said, why? What was I thinking? And after you got through clubbing all night with that guy, you looked at a picture of him the next day. And you said, either what was I thinking or what was I drinking? You said one of the two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, I don't practice. And the thing I hate, God, I always do it. Oh, I love these verses. These things help me. These things set me free. Say, I know y'all got it all together, but y'all need to pray for me. Okay? <laughs> if then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law, talking about the law of Moses, it is good. Verse 17. <clears throat> but now it's no longer I who am doing it. Oh, my goodness, but sin. Now, chapters five and six, all he's talked about is he's been born again. Now, in chapter seven, he said, if I'm doing stuff that I hate, there's still some sin somewhere. Let's hunt for it. Ready? Verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, this right here, I know that in my flesh, listen, nothing good dwells. Some of y'all think y'all so fine. <laughs> Listen to what he said. He says, this right here. He said, this thing's working against me every day. Nothing good to us. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. Now listen. Uh, he said, I've gotten saved, so now my spirit has come alive. And deep down on the inside, I want to do the right thing. I want to serve God. I want to do, I want to be, live a life pleasing. I want to live the blessed life. He said, but when it comes to executing what I need to, I'm never able to do it. So his desires and his actions are in conflict. Have you ever done something you hated the whole time you were doing it? I'll make it easier on you. <laughs> for the will that I, for the good I will to do, I do not do. The evil I will not to do, that I practice. Verse 18. He says this twice. Now, if I keep doing what I don't want to, it's no longer I who do it, but sin is still somewhere. Next verse, I find then a law, oh my goodness, now we've moved to the next level. A law means compelling to action. I was coming in here about 6.30 this morning and uh, there's usually nobody on the road. And right in front of me, I saw a policeman come off the off ramp and got the guy in front of me speeding. I was compelled to put my foot on the brake. I did not want to come to church and make a donation to the state of California this morning. Can I just be honest with you? I'm already making plenty of donations to the state of California. I didn't want to make another one this morning. A law compels to action. He said, so I find then that there's something compelling what I do. Remember, he says, I do the thing I hate. There's something behind it. That evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Next verse. For I delight in the law of God according to my inward man, my spirit. 
those of you that got saved today, you've been born again here in your spirit. He said, inside, I love God. I want to do the right thing. <clears throat> but I see another law at work in my members. Warring against my... Now look, in my inward man, I want to do the right thing. But my flesh has its thing it wants to do. And both of them are sending my mind signals. Yes. Oh, we're going to talk about the mind. And bringing me into captivity. Captive Christians. People have been born again and still handcuffed to things they feel powerless to break. You know what's so bad about that? What you don't break, you hide. And then you're one thing in this life, but you're another thing when you show up at church. And everybody says, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> and then when you leave that atmosphere, the war is on. And nobody gets up every morning and say, man, I just think I want to be a hypocrite today. <laughs> nobody wakes up like that. But there's this, there's this conflict that this guy is an apostle who wrote this. He wrote over half the New Testament and he's saying, I am struggling. I love that. I see another law working against the law of my mind, bring me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my flesh. So the thing that compels me to do wrong is in this. Can I just teach? I see what time it is, but don't look at it. <laughs> Come on, I'm rolling now. I got to teach this thing. Your God is a trinity. Trinity is not a, bi in a bi biblical word. It's not in the Bible. It is a word we have formulated to try to understand him. He is one, but we know him three ways. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Try three, unity, three in one. Trinity. We are made in his image. We are a trinity. You are a spirit, a soul, and a body. It takes those three components that make up your whole person. When you get saved, your spirit, it's perfected. It's done. There's nothing that can be added to it. Those of you that got saved today, you are as saved as you will ever be. You are saved as Billy Graham and Old Roberts put together and all wound up in one. You saved. Can't be no more saved. Okay? So in my spirit, I'm a trinity. I have been saved. Now, in my mind, I am being saved. My body ain't saved. I know my body ain't saved. I came from those churches in the South that tried to save them. Didn't let the women wear makeup and didn't want them to cut their hair and all the men, the cuffs had to be a certain length and all that. They were doing everything they could to save your body. Your body ain't saved. The Bible says you will get a new glorified body when you get to heaven. I hope God has a big computer screen and lets me pick out the one I want. I got a lot of things I don't like about this one. I hope he just lets me pick out all the dimensions, get my biceps just like I want them and everything like that. Do you see what I'm talking about? I don't know if he'll do that or not, but the Bible says we get a glorified body in heaven. So you have been saved spiritually, you are being saved in your mind, and you shall be saved in that day in your body. But right now your body is not saved, and sin dwells in these members, and it, the law of sin is compelling you into action. So you've got to understand if your flesh is not saved, you've got to be able to subdue it, and you've got to be able to manage it. The worst thing you can say is, I'm going to do what I feel like. <laughs> Tell me how that works for you in the words of Dr. Phil. <laughs> you turn this thing loose, you don't need a devil. Your flesh will take your life down the toilet before supper time. Go read Galatians 5. There are 25, 25 or 26 works of the flesh. You won't believe everything this thing can do without the help of anything demonic. <laughs> so I have to manage it. 
I have to subdue it. I do not let this thing do anything it wants to. It listens to my spirit. My spirit doesn't listen to my flesh. <laughs> okay? Amen? So now, it's got to be managed. It's got to be subdued. It's got to be trained. <laughs> I know people don't do it. It ain't just West Coast. It's people don't do it no much anymore. I know people have gone to time out and things like this. But when I was growing up in the South, they just beat you. They didn't nobody do nothing about no time out and all that. They just beat you. No, no, y'all don't understand. Everybody beat you. Every, the, and the people in the neighborhood had permission to beat you. So if, if I was throwing rocks through a window at somebody else's house and they saw me do it, they would come out and they would beat me. Then they would walk me home and tell my daddy they had to beat me. And my daddy said, you had to beat him? They'd say, yeah. And then he would bring me in the house and beat me because they had to beat me. Maybe that's what I'm dealing with, trauma from all these beatings I've been. <clears throat> two things, I'm not going to have time to finish. I've just prepared way too much. And too much information, you start losing it anyway. I try to give it to you enough where we can really retain it. Uh, Genesis 2. Genesis 2. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant in the sight, in, to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two trees in the, in the garden, not one. That's right. One always gets the press, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two trees there. There was the tree of life. Right. Okay? Now, stay with me. Your mind has to deal with nature and nurture as well. Remember generational curses? Nature. Yokes, nurture. Things that come through the bloodline, things that happen to me. Your mind. When Eve took the fruit from that tree, nothing happened. When Adam took it, everything changed. Every vile thing known to the imagination flooded the human psyche that day in that rebellion. Now, God told them, you can have all of it, but don't touch these. So what do we do? Go straight. I mean, you got this whole garden. I mean, they didn't even have to work it. It was paradise. God just looked at them and said, be fruitful and multiply. They were naked. Yeah. Naked. Be fruitful. Do I need to explain what be fruitful and multiply means? <laughs> Do I need to break that down or we got that? <laughs> naked, be fruitful, multiply. And by the way, this stuff grows by itself. What a life! <laughs> well, Pastor, I'm so disappointed in it. No, what a life! <laughs> but don't eat these two. They go right to them. Right. As is the nature of man. Take the forbidden and then whew, everything God did not want in the human psyche came into it. So now we are born with a mind, nature, that has eaten from that tree. I don't believe that, Pastor. Why do you have to train your kids to do right? You don't have to train them to do wrong. They got that down pat. Well, who taught them? You don't have to train them to say no. Okay. You have to train them to say yes. You, don't, you have to train them to share because they know mine all by themselves. <laughs> have you ever noticed that? So people who don't believe that, why do you have to train children? To, if, they, if, if, if you didn't eat from the tree, then we shouldn't have to train them to do anything. But we have to constantly train them to share, train them to be nice, train them about their attitude, train them we don't talk like that, so we don't speak those words. We got to share with our friends. We have to constantly stay on them and train them. What are you trying to train? Their mind. Okay? So you got nature. Let me go a little bit deeper and I'll end this right here. This is good. I used to think in the midst of the garden meant in the middle. 
But then I started doing that word study in the Hebrew there, and the word midst also means suspended. So you got a garden with every tree in the ground producing fruit, but then you got two that are hanging. They got fruit, but no root. Jesus said, I mean, God said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Why didn't they conk over dead when they ate it? Okay, Revelation 2, 7, I'll show you why. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I give him, I'll give him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Those trees were not rooted in the ground. If they were earthly trees, they would have physically died. But they were rooted in the heavens. So they spiritually died when they spiritually ate that fruit. So now, now man is a, a soul and a flesh, but his spirit is dead. So guess what? If any two agree together in the earth, it'll be. So you're coasting along. You're 30 years old and your flesh and your mind, I mean, are married and doing great. And then you come to church and get saved. All of a sudden, this third one moves into the apartment. <laughs> Here comes spirit. And they're like, wait, we were fine without you. <laughs> me and flesh had everything going on. Flesh gave me the signal and I made the decision. Spirit said, but I'm here now. And in my inward man, remember, I delight in the law of God. So now here comes the confusion. I've got my born again spirit sending me signals. And I've got my flesh sending me signals. And my mind feels like it's going crazy. In fact, if I took you on through the rest of these scriptures, you know what the next verse says? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? He says, this is not fun. He says, actually, this is torment. He said, and who will deliver me from this? Now, go to Romans 8, verse 5. Romans 8 and verse 5. I promise you I'm trying to shut this down, but y'all keep saying amen. And when you say amen, it makes me keep going. So what is the answer to this? For those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds. Set their minds. But those who live to the flesh, set their minds. Those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. To align yourself with this, everything's going to start deteriorating and ultimately going to die. He said, but if you join it with your spirit, life and peace. My God, who couldn't find a little more peace in your life? Life and peace. Set your mind. Whether or not your life is awful or whether or not your life is bliss will be on your mindset. That word set there is a medical term. I broke 18 bones in my life. I tallied it up. I spent over three years of my life in some kind of cast. 18 bones. And it was awful because they would have to come in there, the ortho orthopedic surgeon would have to come in there and set. That's the same term here. So God is already presupposing when you come to him, your mind is broken. Yes. And has to be re Set. This is where the conflict comes from. The battle is not just over generational curses and yokes. And the battle is over your mind. Because God has set the head among the members that it is the decision maker. And you are getting two signals if you've been saved every day of your life. Every day, you have the desire to do right and you have the pull to do wrong. You say, Pastor, that scares me. Which one will win? The one you feed? If you looked at Instagram and compared it to how much you was in your Bible and you wonder why your flesh is a monster. Oh, Ron, you shouldn't have said that. You were doing so good. I was going to take you out for lunch, but now you have ticked me off. You can go get your own salad. 
Whichever one you starve dies. Very simple. Whichever one you feed lives. And if you, do, if you have a desire you can't overcome, go back and track your week and look at what you're feeding. Some of you, your spirit is starving because it don't get anything till you step in this building. This 90 minutes is not going to carry you the next seven days. I'm not going to do it. I can't even stand but about 15 minutes of social media at a time. It's so toxic. I can't take it. And I got to go back and find me something wholesome. Why? Because I don't want my flesh in charge. I want my spirit ruling my life. I don't know about you. I need a little life and peace in my life. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. Can we give God praise for that? Uh, stand on your feet with me all over this building. <coughs> no altar call today. Probably next week when we get to some of that stuff, we will. I'm so grateful for you. Are you enjoying this? I need to know. When, when everybody's quiet, I don't. <coughs> I love you. I care about you. And I want you to live your very best life. I really do. I mean that with all of my heart. So I'll do my best to speak and speak clearly. And sometimes we just have to go out and address these things in our life. But remember, if you can whip it here, you can whip it anywhere. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May he establish you and give you peace in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Enjoy this Sunday and go have the best one you've ever had.